Okay, well, welcome everyone to our second discussion, which takes place within our seminar week um, at our studio at ETH Zurich under the topic of what is next. Um, as a guest for our second talk, we invited Anna Schmidt. Anna Schmidt, welcome and thank you very much for joining. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. As a very brief introduction, Anna Schmidt is an artist, author and filmmaker and founded the initiative Basic Income together with Daniel Haney in 2006. Since 2019, he is an academic associate at the Götz Werner Chair for Economic Policy and Constitutional Economic Theory at the University of Freiburg, where he is responsible in particular for public effectiveness and networking of the studies on basic income and from research into financing issues. Anna Schmidt's film, Grundeinkommen, ein Kulturimpuls, which was published in 2008, had a lasting impact on the debate about basic income. Through the film and the fact that the initiative then came to a national referendum in Switzerland in 2016, the topic has been discussed in a broader way in Switzerland, but as well worldwide. Anna Schmidt has since then traveled a number of countries, giving lectures about the idea of unconditional basic income, connecting people and was helping set up basic income organizations. We are very happy now to have you as a guest and um, would like to let you start the talk with an introduction about your work and research. Thank you. So I would like to start with a brief anecdote. Uh, it's about basic income and architecture. The first person who talked to me about a universal basic income was a young architect and he was in favor for this idea because he, he told me, you know, I could make much more um, part participate in competitions, architecture competitions, and that would give me the opportunity to become much better, to have a career when I did not use need to look for money always. So participating in a competition, you know that better than me, needs a lot of time, a lot of effort and money. And so this was his argument that there would be much better chances for young architects and other people um, to come into business and to become better. And when I heard that first time, I thought, you know what guy, become a better architect, then you will win competitions, don't ask for money, don't change the society just for your private personal um, advantage because you know I'm an artist and for me it was important to get into the market and to earn my money by what I'm doing and not asking for subsidies or something like that. That was my first reaction that I thought this is private. But then I heard about this idea from the entrepreneur Götz Werner in Germany and for him this idea um, had arised from his business from his being an entrepreneur. So, and that was much more logical for me. And from that point on, I got the idea and I was totally in favor for it. So the idea of an unconditional basic income for everybody in the society, a basis, a financial economic basis for everybody to set the people free to decide much more better about their own lives which does not mean that people don't strive for money, that people don't um, have jobs and, and do things for money and hopefully a lot of money, but it means that the basis is secure. And then when I met Daniel Henney in 2005 and we decided to do uh, something together, we got the point that an unconditional basic income is the most important thing in the world today. It takes a it makes people much more free. And we, we thought it's, it's less boring in the society, you know, when everybody has to talk about what he's really doing because it's his decision, it's not this blah, blah in conversations. It becomes much more exciting. And so we started in 2006 with the initiative, with the website. And from the first point, from the first moment on, it was important for us that everything has to have quality. It has to be beauty, 
It has to be good written texts. I started with making films. So original, I'm a painter, but then I started making films. And that, I guess, was the success of the first years of this initiative. It was not money for the poor. It was, it, it was not all this established old understandings and argumentations and emotions, all this what, uh, what we know. It was a new idea and this idea is beauty. It's beautiful and it's uh, exciting and it's more sexy and it's a better life and all that. So we did not blame other people, the government or the circumstances, the environment, whatever. We just promoted this idea and that made it a little bit unique in the movement for basic income worldwide. And then maybe you know it when we handed in the signatures of the People's Initiative in 2013, we thought about how to, to make an image of that, that can be um, published around the world. And the image was to take 8 million fünf Rappen, five centime coins, because there is uh, roughly a population of 8 million people in Switzerland, put it in a, a big truck and bring it to the Federal Square in Bern and um, drop it out when we hand in the signatures on that place, on that square. And indeed, this image was spread worldwide and that pushed and um, energized the discussion about basic income worldwide. And this was because it is an image. It is not a declaration. It is not, well, make the world a better place and be, be good and all that stuff. It was an image. And I think this has to do with, um, in a way, with art. So that was not art. I, I never would call that art. But it was an image. And it was not ideological. It was not um, to force people to think what your brain is thinking. It was an image and golden mountain of money and um, 8 million of that 16 tons of real money. So that made the wave. And indeed in the United States from this moment on, they started again to discuss basic income. They forgot it that they have had that discussion in the 1970s. So the success of the People's Initiative was not so much that all Swiss people are lucky about that, but that it gave a huge push in the worldwide discussion. And that was even more when we have had the People's Initiative. So thanks to direct democracy in Switzerland, we could make this topic to a worldwide topic more than everybody else had had the opportunity before. And from this 2016, when the vote take place, took place, um, it is running around the world and there are many pilot projects and so on. So this can be the first introduction. And I think you have your specific questions from your profession to basic income and I'm happy to try to answer it. Thank you very much. That was a really interesting introduction. Um, I hand over to our group of students who prepared some questions for you. Oh, <laughs> I know that. So from our side, thank you for being here with us, Mr. Schmidt. What we just did here was a sort of re repetition of what you did on the Bundesplatz in Bern as a strong image. Um, it's part of your work. And what we would first like to discuss about is your, your definition of work that in our research came up to be quite specific and be more broad than what we commonly see as work as a society. Normally, we would love to hear from you. How do you define work 
what aspects to belong into it. Uh, you mean in general work? No, work is in general? Oh, work. general. You mean work in general, not my work, but what work is in general in my in opinion? In your opinion, your definition okay. is more yeah. broad than what yeah. the current understanding of work is. Yeah. Only not yeah. Much. Okay, work is, work is life. Work is the important part of your life. So you cannot sell work, you cannot pay work because that's slavery, you pay, to, you buy people. So work is um, absolutely you yourself and it's a very important part of you yourself. Work is where you develop yourself. Work is where you contribute to others, where you do things for others. So the definition of work is work is always work for others. This is done by Joseph Boyce already, but that is true. You can prove it, you can check it. Today, everybody on earth is working for other people, not for him or herself. So there's a huge misunderstanding um, by education that people think well, I'm working for myself because I, I get an income. Income is for me, I'm working for the income. So this is a little bit schizophrenia. It's, uh, it makes a society crazy because that's not true. Your work, whatever you are doing is for other people. And this is what people need to find in their life, some sense, some meaning that they can enfold their potential by finding the circumstances and environment and people around them that fits to them and that they find where they can contribute in a meaningful way to society, to other people, to the animals, to bring to earth the good idea of the next building or whatever. So work is in a way much more holy than this um, understanding that work is what you get paid for. So yeah. that is for slave, slaves, not for human beings. And don't be surprised, we have so many understandings from the past in our common understanding. It's not surprisingly, um, and slavery was very usual thousands of years, but the idea that you can buy work and that work is to sell and that work is not your lifetime and, and that's you, so this understanding we have to overcome and an unconditional basic income helps us a lot in this, uh, in this um, task because it split away income and work. You need an income to live and fortunately it would be high, can be high and you need your work to be what you are, to live your life, that's your biography. So your work is essential you yourself and your decision about what you think is the best. And so this is my definition of work, that work is one of the very holy things of our biography of our human being, and is not something others can decide about in the way like um, many people think that would be right to decide about others what they have to do. This is from the past. It's not, uh, it's, not, it's not capable for the future because we have much more individualism and we go further on in becoming more responsible and more freedom is of course more responsibility and requires more responsibility. And that's what people want. You see that in society. And so basic income is a basis for a society where people understand that work is what they are doing because this is their lives and this is their development. This is their where, where they are looking for, for the meaning in the world they would like to have and for what they want to be responsible for. And um, if I should add, it's very interesting your definition of work and that changed our perception of of normal work in, in the society. And my question would be, how does basic income uh, impact work? Because you know, there are maybe less recognized works or even you know, home parents that stay at home or artists, how do you see these works? And how do you see the works that maybe are less valuable, but that we, we still need it, need them? So yeah. you respond to yeah. that. Um, so first it's not less valuable. The work you are mean you you are you wanting to point out is work that is not desirable, because it's a so-called dirty work. 
And if you look carefully about or seriously to what this work is, then you see this is highly valuable in society. It's needed, so it has to be done. And so by that reason, it's highly valuable. It's, it's highly valuable for our society. It's very social, all that so-called dirty work. It's a dirty work. And you think about that like you do and, and you assume that people will not do bad work if there is an unconditional basic income and they can live without earning money by such work. Then you have to see that if there is an unconditional basic income, those people who are doing this uh, very much needed work can negotiate a better wage for it. So why not paying huge, big wages, salaries for those who do this very important, valuable way that we cannot, we cannot uh, miss? So the understanding, our understanding of those people is that those people are dirty people because they have no choice. They have no education, they have no blah, blah. But, in, but actually, if there is an unconditional basic income, the appreciation of such people and that work can rise up. And why not paying a much better salary to those people for, for those labors and works that has to be done and are maybe dirty or maybe not desirable, maybe very exhausting. And on the, so this is the first point and that is uh, what an unconditional basic income will change that people are not the dirty people because they do work you don't want to do. And you think, oh, nobody likes to do that, in particular, not me, and these guys have no chance. So these guys, these people are on a lower level. No, with non-conditional basic income, they are not. And you will see that wages for such work will rise up because it's an important work. And then the understanding and the image of those um, those activities will rise up too. And if I may continue, so you're you're saying that uh, it could it would change the all all way of, of the system of working. But how do you see it if we do it only locally in Switzerland, for example? What would be the consequence in the the rest of the world? Or is it possible to have that kind of island, Switzerland, that having very high, uh, this basic income, and then other countries next in our borders that, that don't have that income. Is it possible to to have this basic income being locally and not only universal? Or what, what would be the, the consequence to, to yeah. make it universal? Yeah. Well, um, do I talk to architects mainly? Are the most of you architects? Right, huh? Okay, then you know, it needs, it needs, first um, to build, what's the name, a fundament and to build a house, a building means planning, needs so many things. And you can assume that such a social building also needs a lot of things and starting with and so on and so on. So it's not to implement in one day from day two to the next day, an unconditional basic income in the, the full amount of a basic income perfectly in Switzerland. But of course it's possible. Um, so one argument I think you, are, you have in your background is migration. But Switzerland is very strict with migra mi migration already today. I know it because I came from Germany to, to Switzerland. It's not so easy to get the, to, to become um, 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 what is the name, and, uh, to be allowed to, to live there. It's enough to have that. So then think about what will happen with an unconditional basic income in Switzerland if, when, when everybody has it. There will be negotiations about wages because the basic income becomes unconditional. Becomes unconditional. So first try to understand what an unconditional basic income is. It's not social benefit. It's not payment. And that's very difficult to think. It seems to be so easy. It's very difficult. Most people cannot think that. It's not social benefit. It is the basic income becomes unconditional. Today, everybody has a basic income, more or less, uh, is, is part of, of the, the current incomes. The basic amount that everybody needs, the basic income becomes unconditional. That will happen 
in the free market that will happen by negotiations of wages so that um, the average wages in Switzerland will fall around about approximately the amount of the basic income. That means it's not so attractive for people to come to Switzerland. Uh, today it's very attractive and appealing because of the high wages. That will not be the same thing when there's an unconditional basic income. So when the basic income has be changed into the unconditional. So that everybody who is living in Switzerland, working in Switzerland as an uh, inhabitant with um, a permission to, to live there has to get the basic income too. And the rules of today for migrants are, yeah, are, are enough to, to, to make sure that there are not illegal people coming to Switzerland just to get a basic income. If you are not uh, registered, registered then you cannot get a basic income. So this problem of migration is not so much. Then the, the other question is um, um, in, in regard to financing. That's a huge question. How do you finance it? And that has a much bigger impact on, on the um, consideration about if Switzerland can implement a basic income alone. So, but first let's look to the process it's always a process, not only one moment. And in this process, you have seen when we have made the people's vote in Switzerland, that moved other countries. Germany is in a move, other countries are in a move. I think the reality is, if Switzerland is going ahead further with an unconditional basic income, of course, other countries will follow in a way. And Switzerland have, has this, in my opinion, huge advantage that it is not part of the EU, that it is um, was about the currency. So it's, it's, it's more independent and that's in addition with direct democracy, is a huge advantage for Switzerland to become a role model for other countries and it could implement that. And it can be to implement it first in a lower, on a lower level or implement it first in some specific regions or whatever. In real, there will be projects at first, pilot projects, so on, so on. There will be not one day where suddenly there is an unconditional basic income. Thank you very much for that. Um, from the island of Switzerland, we would like to go into a more global topic and maybe also see what you find about this current situation of crisis that we face with the coronavirus. Um, we all know the topic, but do you see that it has changed something in the discussion about the basic income, this current situation with the crisis? Yeah, absolutely. I feel so, like this solution to, yeah. Sorry, again, your last sentence. Yeah, do you feel like basic income could be a possible solution for the economic crisis that we are facing at the moment in giving people more security? Yeah, I think that's what you, you think. And that's obviously that, of course, if there would be already an unconditional basic income for everybody, then society would be much more resilient uh, in such a crisis. So purchasing power would be spread in society continuously. Um, to lose your job for a while or time um, would be not such problem. It's, it's a problem, of course. It's not everything fine then. But there would be a stable basis for everybody. People would keep capable to act, to move, to do things. So it would be, would be much better to have already an unconditional basic income in particular when you look to this crisis. And the discussion worldwide um, was pushed and become, became much more um, vibrant because of the coronavirus crisis, or let's better say not the coronavirus, but the lockdown. So the measures of the governments are creating the situation in which we are. Um, so basic income is, discussed much more with much more urgency in many, many countries. On the other hand, you know, think about an unconditional basic income like I talked about in the beginning of this session. 
It is, it is not because we are all so miserable. It is a step into the future for more freedom. It is a cultural income. You can say it's the income for the artist in everybody. It's an income for your creative decisions you are making in your life. It is positive. It is not because people are so poor and we need to eradicate poverty and all that stuff. All that what we are talking about since 100 years and nothing has happened in that direction. With the coronavirus crisis, um, we again have that unconditional basic income is used to solve uh, burning problems. This is not really the idea of an unconditional basic income. This is our old habit that we only move is if there is a catastrophe and only think by being pushed by a catastrophe, not by ourselves. So thinking an unconditional basic income needs to think by yourself and not because you are pushed from any crisis or any catastrophe. And so I'm not so lucky about that turn in the discussion about basic income that it is used as a solution for the bitter need. On the other hand, I'm happy about that because it is, is, is um, discussed more, much more. But you know, for me, unconditional basic income is a step forward in culture, is a step forward in civilization, is a step forward in humankind. And it's not to, 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 to um, close any, to, to, to solve problems directly. It's not this old habit, I don't like it, it's not, artif it's not artistic habit, to have the problem and then you have a tool to, um, to, to solve a little bit of that. And on the other hand, you know, I don't think that unconditionality is really um, in mind in context to corona uh, virus crisis. It is just give people money, help them to survive, something like that. And then there's a, an evil point. You can misuse a basic income, an unconditional basic income, to keep people out of society, out of work, to, 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 to let people stay at home. So you can misuse an unconditional basic income. And that's what part, um, partly is happening now to say, OK, you, a basic income because people have to stay at home. You know, this is division of society. So this huge, big idea of basic income, it's as big as democracy, um, can be misused. And partly it happens when you, when you think basic income for keep people staying at home, keep people staying outside. I just wanted to follow that, that up, what you've said. Um, I mean, I, I find it so. Um, it, it's very powerful what you're what you're saying, and and characterizing work as a thing that gives meaning to our lives, and that's um, fundamentally about dignity, and not about added value in in the economy. Um, and I also agree with what you're saying about the discussion of basic income in the context of the coronavirus. But what the coronavirus certainly has done uh, is expose capitalism as a specific uh, model or structure. It's not God-given. It isn't the only structure. It just so happens to be the hegemonic structure at the moment. Um, also, it exposes that capitalism and democracy are not the same thing. Um, so what I'd like, it, it'd be great if you could elaborate slightly on the relationship of the guaranteed, guaranteed income and capitalism. Because at the beginning, alongside your characterization of uh, this income liberating people to find dignity and meaning in their lives, you also aligned it with individuality and um, kind of self-actualization, which is a characteristic of late capitalism. So I'd, I'd really be interested for you to just discuss a bit more the, the relationship of the guaranteed income 
and capitalism? Does it completely undermine capitalism or is it like the Green New Deal, for instance, uh, a way of extending capitalism? Well, thank you for that question. I will try to do that. So first it's a question what you understand uh, with the word capitalism. There are so different understandings. Just factual uh, capitalism is part of, of the economy, but the meaning of that word is different today. So guaranteed basic income is, um, to make it precisely, this is an unconditional basic income, not just a guarantee that you have a basic income, that's what we have today, it's unconditional paid out for everybody every month, the whole life. This is a difference to just a guarantee. But now, the point is, unconditional basic income does not touch anything, um, also not capitalism. Capitalism is for basic income, that's fine, do what you want, but it enables people to fight for what they think is valuable, to do what they think is important. And there are so many people who are aware of the destruction of everything by this capitalism, what you mean when you talk about capitalism. So much more people can create new forms of enterprises, can create better democratic laws, can create more awareness and consciousness in the public, can report about more things where you see um, that capitalism destroys the world in a way. And even more, I think this um, thinking apart, income and work, um, that is the same, you know, in, in further socialism, communism, socialism countries, that concrete heads ruling there couldn't think apart income and work. And that's one reason why they, why they um, went under, they, they, they were destroyed. And the, the concrete heads of capitalism cannot think income and work apart either. If they do so, their power will decrease. So if people are no longer to force by the threat of their existence to do what others want them to do, then one basis of that kind of capitalism you are talking about is vanished, is away. And people understand that the value of work is not the income. So how stupid can they be? The value of work is not an income, is not money. The value of work is a benefit you give to other people. So this is as an architecture, the value of your life is how good they, those buildings are because they are so beauty, because they are whatever. So the quality of that, that is the value of the work. The value of the work is always the value for other people of that what you have done. And that becomes more tasteable for people with an unconditional basic income. So the ideology that every, everything is about capital and capital means money and much, much money for me, that will decrease. We have a question from the Zoom chat. Um, would you say Marxist positions and notions like work or craft or production, etc., can be read, applied on the contents of the basic income? Well, I never, I have never dealt with Marx. I don't know what he wrote. So I'm not a Marxist, for example, and I don't know much about Marx. But I guess that many things of the ideas of Marx could have a relation to basic income. But one idea has no relation. So Marx wanted that fight against the rich, and that's not basic income. Um, and there's no, no dictator, and there's no fight against others. So an unconditional basic income laughs the rich people, is not for single mothers, is for everybody. So all our common um, um, diversion of for whom we are and against whom we are is not an unconditional basic income. So I think, yeah, many ideas of Marx are interesting, 
and can be developed and changed and you can think about yourself and then maybe there are some parallels to an unconditional basic income because also Marx is a child of the Enlightenment and ideas from that time of Enlightenment um, already um, painted images that can lead to an unconditional basic income like Thomas Paine or even Thomas Morris. Um, but it's not the same. And it is not against one class and it's not class struggling. Unconditional basic income is for human beings. And this is regardless whether you are rich or poor, nice or ugly or whatever, regardless of any circumstances, regardless of any situation of your life and regardless of your opinions or beliefs or your color or your gender or whatever. So this is a new thing. And that on, the one, on, on, on one hand, this inspires people and worldwide. You mentioned in the beginning that I traveled a lot and I was on many continents and I was very wondering whether this idea can touch people everywhere in Asia, in, in Russia, in wherever. And surprisingly and making me happy, it can touch people everywhere because it's a specific human idea. It is not the, dis the, the diversity of different life situations and all that stuff or different cultures or whatever. It is the center point of human being, the appreciation to every individual as a human being to say, yes, welcome on earth, exciting what you will do. And we, we give each other the basis to live unconditionally. So an unconditionally is related to love in a way, but why not this basis in society to say, hello, welcome in society. We don't judge you. You are not, you are not my slave. You are free to live your life with this basis, basic amount. And don't forget, it's just the basic income. You know, people want to be, have more. People will not stop working, but much more new ideas will arise. And I think it's, um, it, it, it will be very um, helpful for all those souls who cannot come in our society today with their understandings, their feelings, their knowledge, and what they think has to be done because of this um, uh, very tight structure of society today, ruled by employment and earning income is the most important thing. And we will see so many innovations, so much more sensitivity, sensibility for the problems we are facing. So today, I think many, many urgent targets are not um, done. We don't work on what is really necessary today because of the old ideology that people has to work for money. And that is very limited in quality, in sensibility, in intellectual, um, boxes, an unconditional basic income will, will create much or, or allow much more innovation, creativity, plurality, and humanity. Okay, um, maybe a question because you were saying that work is not an income, no? And on the one side, I find the sentence very great. But at the same time, I have a question because I don't know, maybe recognition or even merit is something that I think useful, no? Maybe a, a salary can give you kind of recognition. And even we're speaking about uh, socialism or capitalism. Uh, where do you situate yourself? Because in one part, we are in a kind of interventionism with a basic income. And the other side, we still are in a kind of liberalism. So. Maybe a specific example for us architects, if we do an internship, sometimes they are not paid. So a basic income could be great, you know? But at the same time, I don't know, maybe a wage can, could give some kind of recognition. What do you think of that? Yeah, thanks for that question, because that's, an, um, that's a huge point. So again, to understand, a basic income is just a basic income. A basic income becomes unconditional. That does not say that um, earned money is bad 
It does not say that people should not want to become rich. It does not say anything. So we are used to think such ideas as an ideology, but it's not an ideology. ideology. It is just an unconditional basic income. There's nothing against uh, becoming rich, nothing, nothing against those, those people who, who want to have a Maserati or Ferrari, nothing against that. So people will earn money. To get money is an uh, important appreciation and proves that things are needed by others. So payment is a great thing. Payment has to do with emancipation in human history. It was so important that people get paid because that is emancipation. They are not just part of, of the family or part of that community they are in. They can move because there is employment because there's payment. So payment is an important emancipatory part of our history. And we don't forget that. But today, in addition, as a next step, in addition, we need to make the basic income unconditional to become that um, freedom, that capability to move, to change, to decide by ourselves, to find out, figure out more sensible uh, um, ways of living, working, and so on. So that non-conditional basic income is not against the emancipatory and, and, and very important ro uh, role that it is playing in our society. Of course, when you are an artist or an architect or whatever, you want to, to be paid for it because that expresses and proves and, and, and makes sure for you, oh, this is important. Well, this will stay. This is, this is untouched by an unconditional basic income. An unconditional basic income gives the basis which is unconditional. So to your question, <clears throat> um, it does not change. It does not ask for change in mentalities. It does not, it's not a moral thing to say, oh, now we have an unconditional basic income, please don't earn money or please don't be a, a capitalist or whatever. You can be that, but it will change mentalities, moods, common understandings. And maybe then just money is not that important thing that it is for some people today because there are more people who are, who are living their values. And I give you a short, very brief example. A friend of mine is a manager and he is really a pit bull. He is really, he is horrible. He is a manager from the horror book. And I said to him, but he is my friend. And I said to him, you know, I'm, I'm doing this with the basic income, but that's not interesting for you, unconditional basic income, because you are a manager. You are, you are always looking for hard business and, and success and so on. And then he said, wow, why? Why do you think so about me? If there would be an unconditional basic income, maybe I would um, rethink whether that is really important what I'm doing. So if there's an unconditional basic income, many people will rethink if those values they are running behind are really their values. And it's open what they do then. It's open. It's not a decision by the basic income. Basic income does not say you are a bad guy if you are looking for money, it's fine, do it. So an unconditional basic income is not an ideology. Um, thank you very much. Um, I have another question because you were uh, very quickly at the end of your initial presentation talking about that the basic income um, would could be misused for keeping people out of society in terms of not, uh, in, in terms of paying them, but um, not uh, letting them work in a sort of way. And as you presented, the base idea of the basic income to be uh, very plausible. Um, I was thinking if this would shift now, wouldn't there be a lack of education in a way or of, um, yeah, how would you, um, solve this problem of um, because you first would have to enable everyone in a way to think really think of what they would like to be doing no this is maybe um, sounds weird but it's an issue I think yeah 
Yeah. So sorry, when I'm talking about that, it sounds so um, everybody knows what he or she is doing and so on. I know that many people don't know that so much. So it's just to make clear what can happen with an unconditional basic income. Uh, reality is that, of course, many people are just looking for what is offered in the job market or what do I have to do because my parents is like that or something like that. But then you mentioned education and have a look to education of today. And then you see that we are educated to be that way. So what, what, what is interesting for you as a child is not the question in the school. It's a question that you have to be interested in what the teachers are also not interested in, but that's the plan what they have to learn. So we are trained to don't do what we really want to do. We are trained to not asking what is really interesting for me. We don't get the help um, to, to, to our desire to learn things. things. We are pushed much more in the direction of um, being capable, being shaped for getting a job. And so I think Many things in education can change with an unconditional basic income because parents are not so much afraid that their child, ch children will not get a job. It's awful that education today is just um, the, the training for getting a job on the job market. And I don't know, but I think you as architects uh, know a bit what you want. And why do you think that this is different by other people? It's not but the today education system is um, killing creativity and killing interests and, and intrinsic motivations. So laziness, what you also find in society is a very healthy reaction on always being forced to do things you don't, you don't value, you are not interested in. So I think it's, it's not, yeah, education is a, is, is a center point for me which will become more um, open to situations where you look to the children or look to the students what they really want and where the interests of th those people are and to appreciate, appreciate much more than today that the young generation is bringing in the new ideas. Even if these new ideas are not shaped, not in that form that they can argue, but it is the impulse of the future. And our current system, education system, doesn't appreciate that, but is always thinking young people has to fit into the boxes of the past. And this is mainly what um, employment means, or that everybody has to earn money for their lives. So it, it is an obstacle for going to the future for me. And an unconditional basic income is a little bit of breakthrough, a little bit open up new perspectives of life, open up, enable new biography, and this starts by education. Was it the question? Was it the question? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, we have another question in the chat, actually. Um, uh, sorry, one second. Um, by Martina, she's asking, do the thoughts on the basic income consider the situation for women in general? Um, she's referring to the fact that there are still many women in need of support since living in patriarchal structures that influence their mindsets. Absolutely, of course, yes. Yeah, I can tell long stories, but absolutely, yes, of course, this is a huge topic. And this is a huge topic of an unconditional basic income because, you know, more, of, more than half of all work done in our society in Switzerland or in Germany is unpaid done. It's unpaid done. So and ask artists or you yourself as architectures, how, how, how much work is unpaid done? And in particular, this is work done by women. So the society is living by the voluntary work or this unpaid care work. That is what makes the cohesion of society. That is what makes a society 
uh, worth living. It's mostly the unpaid work. It's much import more important than the paid work. And that makes evidence that our ideology that work is always what is paid for is totally not true. And, and, and that is in, in, um, with regard to women so important to see this different view on society. So women mostly um, choose work or let's call jobs with social relationships. And, and some, sometimes I'm, I'm saying men could learn to work from women because women are working when they see something is necessary. Men are working when they get paid for. So that's, that's stupid. Um, yeah, I think we need the understanding of work from women. We need um, equality in, in, in work. Non-conditional basic income will not pay care work, but it enables work. And it brings in this aspect that work is probably um, better if you don't look to the money, but to your to your baby or to your customer or to whatever. So this is only a few sentences about this huge topic of UBI and gender. Um, and there's also criticism that people say this is that um, women are forced to stay at home again because they have an unconditional basic income. That's a huge topic. I cannot talk so, so everything about that, but of course, yes, this is so important to become aware about all that unpaid work, to become much more aware about the female view on society and work and everything like that. And not at least an unconditional basic income gives the opportunities and decisions much more in the hand of partnership. So it is the same level then. And of course, and that is the result of a pilot project in 1970s in the United States, that there has been a bit more divorces because women could leave their drunken, brutal husbands with the children and live their own lives. So they did not depend so much on the economic uh, support from the husband or male partner. Just to follow that, um, you were saying how the, um, the guaranteed income wasn't a kind of, wasn't a morality. And I can see that in the abstract or as a strategy, it's not. And that's really one of its strengths. But clearly the forces that would be or are against it you know, the forces that say the CEO of a bank is worth 12 million a year and the CEO of a pharma company is worth 20 million a year, uh, worths that are completely, um, they're fictitious. You know, there's no way those people are worth that amount of pay. But that, that, whole, that whole structure of payment somehow being, people being worth those sorts of amounts is based on a kind of um, a moral social structure. So the guaranteed minimum income is in fact a challenge to one set of values. Um, and isn't it true that by giving a value to what has traditionally been non-productive work, for instance, care work, which is a huge crisis all over the world now, uh, that there's no money in society to care for people. And that's one of the most important things in society. Um, isn't it true that the instrument of the guaranteed minimum income, it's, I don't know if it's an ethical code or a moral code, but it does actually require a transformation of our worldview. So in that respect, it, it, it's, I understand why you're selling it as being without a kind of morality. It's a very strong argument, but actually underneath it, the, the, the things that you want to have much higher value 
are part of a alternative ethical vision for how we should lead our lives. Absolutely, absolutely. So it is, it is not um, a moral um, advice, but of course, it opens up moral um, feelings, moral behavior. And that is, your statement is very well in itself. Yeah. So I think that will happen. So we're doing our last question now. Yeah, maybe to finish, because linked to the, the theme of this seminar week, we wanted to ask you, but what do you think is next? So for you, the next steps, and even as an advice to us, you know, because um, maybe for us it's okay, we are students and we are in that theme, but how do you, as you did with your initiative, you, you had to to get in touch with the old population and uh, how did you do to convince the people what's next for you in that sense and for us even not to, to be just ideological but even realistic in, in that sense? Well, um, uh, let me say one point. I didn't want it or didn't try to convince people so much. I wanted to bring that idea to people and they are free to deal with it. So I'm an artist, I'm a painter. I'm always interested to bring things up to an image, to a picture, to something that you can become aware of. I, I want to make things clear. I want to bring things up. And I guess that's the same for an architect in a way. So from the invisible, not existing, you are feeling that there's a lack, there's something is missing, and you are going behind that, up to that point where you see what idea it is, where you see how the building is looking like. And I, so that is the same in my approach to arguing for an unconditional basic income. I'm delivering this image, I'm delivering this idea as clear as I can, but also as human as I can, as an image, as a sculpture, as a building, whatever, call it, name it. Uh, and people are free to deal with it. I don't want to convince people. So I'm not interested by it. It's the responsibility. It's the luck and the happiness of the people. It's not mine. If people don't want to understand an unconditional basic income, arguing against it, do it. So that's not my problem. My problem or my, my approach is to, to make it visible in the, in the in the most best way from my side. And I think um, when you ask me for what is next, so I don't know what is next in society. I'm working on basic income further on and now in the scientific context, context. Which, is, which is very difficult because science is very, it's, it's always in the tendency to kill everything. But on the other hand, it can make, um, it can help for the for, for argue for basic income. That's what I'm hard working on in the moment. But when you ask me that question, what's next in regard to you and to said and the students, then phew, I can say um, my experience from 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 my life is that um, you really can get what you want. You just have to pay the price for it. So you can have visions, you can have the most um, unbelievable ideas and you can get to it. You can make it real in a way, um, believe to yourself, but yeah, it's always that you also have to pay the price. So to, for example, to work very hard for it, to example, to, to, to miss many other things. But if you want to, to achieve your visions, and hopefully the visions will change and the ideas will change in your life. And often it comes to the point where there's nothing and you have to start again. So, but life is good and you can achieve everything without a basic income. 
So basic income is not, is, it, it, does, it does not say we are in such a bad uh, society. We have a lot of freedoms. We have a lot of opportunities. It just has to become better. That's an unconditional basic income. It's not to say, oh, I, can't, I cannot do things because there is no unconditional basic income. That might be true, but that's not um, the excuse of your life. So there will be less excuses with an unconditional basic income. But for the, the question, what is next is, to the next step to the world you desire to live in. Uh, that's a really great place to end it. Thank you so much, Eno. That was really fantastic discussion. Uh, Thanks a lot. To Thank meet you, you virtually. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good night.